on. All right. You guys uh, I think we're on air, and we're just talking. We're just hey, everyone. <laughs> so, what's so up? Professor, hey, okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Fraser Kane. I am the publisher of Universe Today, and this is a virtual star party Woo. for uh, July 14th. 2013. Uh, so we're having a few technical issues and a few last-minute issues and a bad weather uh, across these uh, this North America of ours. So um, we're, I think we've worked through them, but unfortunately, so. or fortunately, uh, we've only got two live telescopes with us tonight. So we will. Uh, so it's going to be the Gary and Corey show, which would be great. Yeah. Uh, so, but I also want to introduce sort of a new person who's going to be joining us uh, in future weeks. He's joined us last week and had a bit of a bit of some technical problems. And this week we've got him settled down, but he's got dark skies. It doesn't have clear skies, but I wanted to sort of introduce you, and he's going to share a few pictures while we uh, while we go through some of the live stuff. So this is Chris Elliott. Yep. Hey, Chris. So, so where are you located, Chris? I'm in North Tonawanda, New York. Okay, as and how... I could tell by the Buffalo Sabers hat. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and and uh, are you like how are your skies where you're located? I am in the orange, so it's right between red and orange on the Bordel scale, so it's not too bad. I'm about 15 miles from Buffalo. Okay. So it's not too bad. I'm north, so I'm right right between Buffalo and Niagara Falls. Oh, okay, right cool. On. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm a yellow on the uh, on that scale where I'm located. Uh, Corey, what are you? What am I? Um, yeah. I am on the on the border of an orange and yellow. Oh, okay, um, all right. So just outside of a town. So. Yeah. So and that and this is. Uh, oh, and sorry, one last thing, Chris. What's your what's your setup? What's your telescope and setup? The setup I have is a CG4 dual axis Omni mount. And I have a six-inch Celestron telescope that's on that. Cool. Okay. I don't know if you have a picture of it at some point. We can kind of we can kind of share. Yeah, not of right it. now. Next week I will. Sure, that'd be great. Uh, just yeah, to show people yeah. the show people the stuff. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. So Corey Schmidt yes, is uh, you are going to be performing all kinds of mad experiments tonight. I'm gonna try. Yeah. Like a like an evil do-it-yourself scientist. <laughs> have you like have you got some kind of radio your own home built radioactive uh, you know reactor for the for your mount? No, you're using a new mount this week, right? No, but I did get a new car battery today, so I can you have go Oompa mobile Loompa's for running longer. It. So, oh wow. You need Oompa yeah. running it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so you've got a new mount that you're testing out. Yeah, I'm testing a, a Celestron Advanced VX mount that they recently... It's kind of like the, a reboot of the CG5, it seems. I don't know exactly what it is, other than it's the same size as that, and they just released it, and it's made for astrophotography. So, so far, I really, really, really like it. The motors are amazingly smooth, so I'm going to buy one. Yeah? Cool. Yeah. Right on. Okay. And uh, we've got Gary Ganella in uh, the Los Angeles area. Hi, everybody. And now, Gary, you were looking at a few spotty clouds. We saw a couple of your pictures, and there's a few clouds in there. So yeah, I think they're uh, breaking off. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, and your scene was really clear though when there weren't clouds. So hopefully, we'll be able to sort of enjoy that. Uh, and we've got Scott Lewis, also in the LA area. Yes. Sorry, I was tweeting. Were you tweeting? Hi, Twitter. <laughs> Hi, I'm letting you know we're here. <laughs> Uh, yes, LA. Yeah. So I'm in the on that skill. I'm the don't even bother unless you have an office really? scope yeah. with filters. Yeah, yeah, you're like bright white. Well, I'm bright white anyway, but that has nothing to do with <laughs> optics. <Yeah>. Right. <laughs> with your T-shirt, yeah. I'm, I'm translucent, and so. Yep. Uh, so, uh, right. So then this week, uh, if you want to reach out to us and talk to us, sorry, we're doing about 800 things all at the same time. I apologize. We've made our process a lot more complicated, and so only a f half of my brain is currently functioning. Right. So, and a lot um, of things have changed. So we have to changed. like we yeah. have to go back and reinvent the wheel. Make yeah, um, but uh, but yeah. So you can interact with us if you wish, and there's a bunch of places that you can do that. The first place is if you're watching this over on YouTube, you can uh, you can go ahead and interact with us there. And while you're there, click on subscribe wherever the subscribe button is. Um, you can uh, comment over on the event page on Google Plus if you're watching this there. You can comment on the um, 
Sure. Uh, the event page, you can comment on my stream if you're watching it from there. You can comment on Twitter, although we don't have a way to track Twitter anymore, right? I've got Hootsuite open. Do you? Okay, all right. Hashtag Star Party. Okay, I am and not going to do that. So if you I've use got the hashtag, it. okay, if you use the hashtag Star Party, or if you use our Twitter feed, uh, the underscore VSP. That's right. Hopefully, we'll see that as well. Um, but the Facebook. best kind of state or Facebook and Facebook, I Facebook. And we're on Friendster and, and, we're on Friendster. No, and we're I on just Friendster. posted a new article on Universe Today, <laughs> putting up the video. So if you want to make comments on there, we will not see them. We're, I we're guarantee. Also on Vine, but you can only watch the BSP in six second <laughs> <laughs> Six second. <laughs> All right. All right. Enough chitter chatter. Okay, anyway, but we, we're glad you take requests. If you if there's something up in the night sky, we'll try and grab it for you. And uh, let's get rolling. Yeah. Uh, what was that, that all-sky view that you had there, Gary? Can you please go back to that? Right here. I'm just playing to see if I can get that working, and I can't. There she is. That's, uh, oh, that's amazing. That's from me. It was, um, when I first told you, most of this part of the sky was clouds, but now there's just uh, scattered. Looks like you got a mouse on your, on your camera. Yeah, I do. Yeah, running across. <laughs> uh, oh, and and last week, I don't know if this is happening, but last week we were uh, we were experiencing this really weird change to the way Hangouts worked, where when I click on someone's view to kind of make it the big view, it gets uh, we lose a little film strip at the bottom. So I don't know if people uh, are seeing that this week. I just I just clicked on Gary's view, and I don't know if that happened. So if you can give I'm, me some feedback, that would be great. I'm looking on YouTube right now, and I'll let you know if I see. Okay, yep, great. It did. It removed the film strip. It did, yeah. Okay, so this is this is the new feature. I'm not a fan. All right. Um, Jeremy Taylor says, cool new mic. Actually, this is my regular mic. I just usually have my lower third in front of it, so you just don't see it. Yeah. I just haven't put my lower third. There. You have all your magic showing. You have the, the lights behind you oh. and your mic showing. Yeah, 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 yeah. My telescope right over there. And your epic beard. Yeah, my That's epic where beard. his real power comes yeah. from. Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, cool. So let's go. To, let's go on with the view. So I'm going to start with Corey's view. And so this. Oh, look at that. And this is Corey. How come you only did a 60 second view? This you should have done a much yeah. longer view. You done, like, yeah, I should have. I'm sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> he was like, time, I'm going to do a three. I'll do three yeah. minutes. Yeah, he, so. before he was like, I'm going to do a three minute view, and I'm like, we do not have time. Do a do a 60 second view. So uh, still, that's gorgeous. Corey. That's gorgeous. Yeah. So what is this, Corey? This is the Trifid Nebula. Um, I don't remember. Is it, is it M8 or M20? Which one, Scott? Go. M20. Nice. Two zero. M20. All right. So and NGC sixty five fourteen. I can actually fit M8 and M20 in the same field of view in this particular scope, and I have that, but I haven't processed it yet. But anyway, I just did this one because it was fast. So. And I think it's important for uh, people to understand that we are in nebula season now. So, you know, in the spring we were in galaxy season, and now it's summertime, and we're in nebula season. So uh, expect to see all of our favorite nebulae. All right, I'm going to try moving over to Gary's view now. Okay, this is um, M16, the eagle. And I can nice. zoom in a bit. This is um, a 60-second bin 2x2. Two so I've got quite a bit of room to uh, to zoom in on it. Very good. But here's wow. the uh, the famous pillars of creation right there. That's awesome. I approve. I can I can even make out the uh, the dark lane between these two pillars. But that is from my backyard right now. Yeah, and it's it, like it's really important wow. to understand that you're actually in a terribly light polluted part of the world, possibly the most light polluted part of the world. And yeah, uh, and you're able to get probably worse. Is it? Yeah, and you're probably able to sort much. of. Yeah, and you're able to get this. So, um, uh, so the Eagle Nebula, and this is where we really want uh, to have Thad here to explain stuff. Otherwise, it's just another stuff for us to do. Um, so M16 Eagle Nebula, um, and it's an emission nebula. So this is a star forming region, uh, and. Those pillars there, those are actual sort of regions of, of star formation. And what's really interesting about this, and we've done a, a bunch of articles on this, is that though we're seeing those pillars as they were about 7,000 years ago 7, because the Eagle Nebula is 7,000 light years away. 
And so what's probably there's a bunch of really bright stars in that same area which are just about ready to, to detonate as supernovae because what you get in these great big emission nebulas is you get these, you know, these you get stars of all different sizes. You get big stars, you get small stars, you know, very massive stars. And those very massive stars run out of fuel and detonate as supernovae very, very early on. And so one of those stars has probably already exploded. The shock wave from that supernova has probably collapsed and blown away the pillars of creation. So we're seeing something that probably doesn't exist anymore, which is just mind-bending. Yeah, it just you, you're thinking about it. You know, light has a very finite speed. So when you're talking about these large distances, when something is seventy or excuse me, seven thousand light years away, that means it takes light that long, 7,000 years actually reach us from that point. So anything yeah. that happens between that time, it's completely changed. And so I plan on waiting when I become a cyborg to see how that does change. For, for the <laughs> right. So, so what's going... Yeah, when you have into your third robot body. But yes. So what's going on, right? So Spit, the Spitzer Space Telescope observed this area a couple of years ago, and they found that nearby regions seem to have been disturbed by a supernova that went off about 8,000 or 9,000 years ago. And so that shock wave, you know, when you sort of time it, that shock wave is going to blow out those, uh, those pillars of creation very soon. So. And for those that um, are maybe new to our broadcast, I am shooting in the light of hydrogen alpha, which is a red light given off by excited hydrogen. It's a very, very narrow band filter. So all the other light given off, I'm blocking out. Otherwise, if I try to look at this with a regular camera, while I could probably make out the shape, that'd be the best I could do. Right. Yeah. Because you're still technically in Los Angeles County, right? Or you in San Bernardino? I'm in San Bernardino County. But, but you're barely in San Bernardino. Yeah. <laughs> like Ontario <laughs> and... Yeah. The, yeah, the skies here are, are crud when it comes, so you do mm -hmm. have to block out all that other light just to be able to see these... And H alpha is a great thing to image in anyway. So we got a great question from uh, from Rolf Hofner, and we get this question probably pretty much every week, which is, "What telescope do you rec recommend for starters for this kind of a site?" Uh, and Corey, you've been through about eight different telescopes, so you know <laughs> if a person wants to kind of get started, um, what telescope would you recommend? Oh, I muted you, Corey, because you were like. Typing on your keyboard. Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, um, it depends on what you want to do because different setups are, you know, better for photography and d than visual. So I mean, like we, I think we we talk about it, you know, most weeks is if you if you want to go strictly visual, get a Dob, get a Dobsonian, um, because bang for your buck, that's what you're going to get. Um, if you want to go um, photography, don't get a Dob. <laughs> that's, <laughs> so that's what's pretty the Dobsonian? But I yeah. think Chris, I mean Chris, your setup sounds like a really good kind of mid-range telescope. Yeah. So like, you know, what what would your set a person back? Well, what I had I had a Dobson about two, about a year ago and it, Corey's right and it is for visual only because you have to manually move the mount and move the telescope in order to capture different things with a dual axis motor drive, you'll be able to track everything that goes into the sky and with my telescope it's an f5 which is the focal length divided by the aperture of the actual telescope itself and the mine is a six inch yeah yeah and so you know you sacrifice uh, size of sort of your viewing area like with a Dobsonian you can afford a 10 inch Dobsonian which is a yep. gigantic light bucket um, mm -hmm. But if you want to have that tracking and that mount for doing the astrophotography, then you're gonna then you're gonna focus on the mount and the tracking, and that's gonna limit the actual size of the aperture because the the weight of the telescope means that the mm -hmm. mount has to get bigger and so on and so forth. So I mean, Corey again, uh, yeah. And they and Fraser, they do have dops that can track, but you're gonna be like. Uh, what is an empty wallet because it costs you <laughs> thousands. Yeah. 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 With the, and this is you know where we make these jokes about Corey because Corey is a, uh, a a classic example of somebody here who has built his own mount for his Dobsonian. So he took his you know his ten inch Dobsonian and then actually you know built his own wedge mount for it and made it work and right. was able to track with it and so on and so forth. And so uh, okay, cool. I'm gonna go to uh, Gary's view because I can see Corey's queuing up something new here. Uh, so Gary, what is this? 
This is M17, the Swan Nebula, very close to M16. And this is another um, nebulosity area that, um, as you can see, one of the problems with taking single shots is the exposure here. This area is totally overexposed. But for me to get any detail in here, I've got to overexpose that. So normally I'll take longer shots and I will stack them together so that I can get that information. I can get the what's in here and the details of what's outside. Well, it's just so bright. So, so that, that part right in the middle there is a whole bunch of newly forming stars. And so they're just in this sort of rate of furious star formation and the, the light, the really hot you know, radiation pouring off of those stars are you know, making all of this surrounding gas and dust glow really bright to the point that it's sort of blowing out your, your exposure. Yeah, um, another interesting thing here... Um, I'm taking unguided right now because all these are one minute shots or so and um, without the guiding without following a star every once in a while the mount won't move correctly and it did this in the middle you can see each one of these stars had a stutter yeah so it went to there so it didn't track exactly 99% right. of the time I get good tracking from one minute photo but every once in a while no gears are perfect now I see Scott's got uh got sort of where we are right now. Or you went to the... I'm, I've got Stellarium pulled up. Yeah, yeah. So, it, yeah, here's M17. It's also called the Omega Nebula as well. Yeah. And we can zoom in here real quick and take a look at what we're looking at. It's also called the Lobster Nebula. I, no, I want crab legs. Yeah, I don't see it, but... Uh, <laughs> so, right, so so what's really interesting, if you zoom out a little bit more, you can see this sort of this fuzzy part that's going across the middle of the screen there, and that's the Milky Way. And so the constellation of Sagittarius, which is that teapot right down there, <laughs> um, which is great. I love the Sagittarius. It totally looks like a teapot. Um, and for me, it, like, never gets too high above the horizon but because I live really quite far north. So is um, it always kind of short and stout? Short and stout, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, and so the... And so the Milky Way, you know, we're looking right down to the disk plane of the Milky Way. And so you're getting all of these stars and nebula and clusters. And a lot of this, this stuff is quite densely in the Milky Way. And so um, as opposed to, for example, when we're in spring and we're able to see Virgo, you know, we're located in the Virgo supercluster of, uh, of galaxies. And so we can see all of those galaxies big and bright interacting in, in Virgo. But right now, we're, you know, the, the core of the Milky Way, this is the very center of the Milky Way, is nice up and above the horizon, and we're seeing right into it and seeing all this, this, these nebulas. So, Which is kind of awesome really to think about. You know, we, we are looking into the core of our own galaxy. Yeah, totally. And I, I know a, a little while ago, here in L.A., people were actually able to see it. They were freaking out. Like, they've never seen it before because <laughs> it, we have such horrible skies. And I, yeah. I see something in the sky. I'm like, yeah, that's your cosmic neighborhood you're actually looking into. I know you, you, I was just in L.A. yesterday, and you see maybe six stars in downtown L.A. Yeah. Maybe. Oh. Uh, so I got a question from Jeff Goodall, which is, is the photo in black and white for a reason? Clarity, choice, thanks. Um, so, Scott, do you want to explain uh, black and white CCDs versus color? Um, well, what, what really Gary's doing, he's only getting light in one small swath coming through. He's getting in hydrogen alpha. So it's coming through and exciting the, the pixel, the detector of the CCD. When you're getting these color images in, especially with the CCD there, you're get, gathering it in certain parts of light and you're actually able to combine them into the red, green, blue, and some, you can just do full luminance if you want as well. So with what we're seeing here, you're just getting light in this very particular band of light and it's coming out through black and white. But Gary can actually go through and do composites if he has different... Um, different filters on. I know that you've done it with your, what, your O3 filter, Gary? Yeah, and... I normally use the hydrogen, the oxygen, which is O3, and the sulfur, which is sulfur 2. Right. Yeah. And so just and... like we see light here, I have an incandescent light bulb and I'm a bad person for having one, but <laughs> it, you know, it's getting white light because it's burning, it, it, you're heating up an element and it's giving off light in the full visible light spectrum. When we're looking at this coming through on Gary's stream, we're taking that full spectrum, which is kind of like what I have here, and taking a right. small fraction of it, and that's all we're looking at. Right. We're talking out everything else. And so, you know, a lot of cases, you know, most prof you know most astronomers actually prefer to use these black and white CCDs because it gives you a much better resolution, better detail 
in right. your image, and the, so what they'll typically do is they'll, they'll they'll take three colors, right? They'll do a red one, then they'll do a blue one, and then they'll do a green one, right. and then put those, composite those together into a single full color image after the fact. We're doing this stuff live, so you're just seeing the raw data that comes in. Now, I'm going to move over to Corey's view, and he's got a different object. Yeah, this is M8, the Lagoon Nebula. Right, okay, so he's doing, so you can see it looks, it's in color with what Corey's got, and in this case, Corey has, he's just connected up a, um, a DSLR, so it, uh, you know, like a Canon, his, it's like a T3. T3i, right? It's a T2i. A T2i, yeah. So he's, he's just hooked up a DSLR. It's also to... been modified to remove the infrared filter. Right. And so, so they're great. I mean, they're I've got one too. They're just a great big CCD that you can stick right in front of your telescope right. and gives you a really great view. So uh, both methods work. Uh, you know, for the virtual star party, I like the... The color CCD is because you get to see this beautiful color, this nebulosity in it. But you know, if you're using, uh, but Gary's view is also great too because it gives us great detail. So, so you'll find if you watch a bunch of our virtual star parties, we've got so many different telescopes and so many different setups that actually it's great to just see all of this this variety. So, um, did we lose your image there, Corey? I wanted to. Uh, I'm more bringing about it back it. up. I I was queuing up another one. So. Okay. Okay. Yep. So. Yeah. And that was the, that was the lagoon, right? Yeah. This is the lagoon. Yep. Yeah. That's just amazing. And it's the same thing. It's another like you know. It's <clears throat> also in the constell. You know, it's constellation Sagittarius. You've got you know right. really really bright star forming regions in it. Um, and it's well, here's where we were. If you want to see our oh screen. sure yeah we were right here um, with Gary's view, and now we're we're over here. So here's Sagittarius again, right through the Milky Way, and we're able to. It right here, and that's what we're looking at. With yeah, this beautiful red area. Are you doing the same, Gary? Yes. And, okay. Um, for some reason, my connection to my scope has gotten very slow. You can see how it's building I can, the picture. Yeah, I can see that it's filling in very slowly. Is your telescope yeah. using BitTorrent in space? Yeah. It must be. I think yeah. it's Nickernet. There we go. Oh, look at that. All oh, right. Yeah. And we always talk about this: how it, 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 the way you've got it rotated, it's the Borg. Yeah. <laughs> um, it is a Borg. Yeah, I think I'm um, hard to tell my rotation. I got a request for the Hourglass Nebula. Uh, I think it's up. Yeah. But this one I've done at um, no binning. You mean the dumbbell? Is the Hourglass down right now? Is it the, d the dumbbell nebula? You mean M27? Let me see. I mean, I've never yeah. heard it called the Hourglass, but... It yeah, looks let's like see the dumbbell. Hour. Yeah, let's see the dumbbell. Okay, I can do that. Okay. I th I've, what I've got up right now is the Sagittarius star cloud. All right, I'm going to move to that. Wow. It's full of stars. And this is a 90-second exposure now. And you can see that there's a couple of knots, a couple of star clusters. I mean, your field of view is so wide that you're just getting all kinds of stuff, right, all at the same time. So why yeah. is it called the, the, the Sagittarius Star Cloud? I haven't heard that term before. Um, I think that the cloud itself is actually the small um, cluster in the middle. Um, it's M24, and um, it's just, you know, it's not quite a globular, cl globular cluster, but it's denser than an open cluster. So. Yeah, okay, so it is M20, M24. Yeah. I'm not going to go into technical details on it because I'll get them wrong. Come on, get them wrong. It's all right. It's got about a okay. thousand stars in it. A lot of stars, and uh, I threw them there because I have a really good arm. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Too technical. <laughs> so I'm looking up the the hourglass nebula. I'm not finding a designation, but I do. I have found where it's at. And I can put it into the chat here. It's right ascension and declination coordinates. If you guys want to look for it. Oh, Kevin's saying it's inside the lagoon nebula. It's oh. in the lagoon nebula. What? Well, then, then you just saw it. <laughs> it was right there. You just saw it. You saw it I want to see the creature from the, the lagoon nebula. Yeah, the let me go back to Gary's view here. I'm uh, I'm shooting the dumbbell right now. Okay, that sounds great. Since I did this with no bidding, so it's the full resolution of the camera. Here's my field of view, and I can zoom in in these areas and see 
you know, like these shock waves. Yeah. The dark areas. Let me uh, let me go a little bit. I can go a little bit more and get a little more detail. Now you can see the dark areas, which are the star forming regions, and then we have the bright center, where something is really irritating the hydrogen, or exciting it. Excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> An annoying it. Well, annoying it's around hydrogen. between four and six thousand light years away, so it's a little bit closer than what we were looking at earlier. But it's it's so large. You have a huge field of view there, right? Gary? Yeah, yeah. I'm uh, about a degree and a half, ninety seconds, uh, ninety minutes wide by about sixty-two minutes high. Right. Right. And for people who are wondering, sort of what that what that means, the uh, um, the full moon you could fit what is it? Three full moons side to side and two three. full moons top mm -hmm. to bottom. So you could yeah, end up with... Three. I can fit three full moons. So yeah. my setup is not good for the moon or planets because it doesn't. It's just like looking at the moon with your eye. Right. right. And that also gives you a perspective of how big these things are in the sky. If you could see them with your naked eye, they would be huge. You know, three times the width of the full moon. Yeah. Uh, okay, so Chris has posted a picture here. I'm going to go to that. There we go. But that's not live, just so everyone knows this is not live. No, this is... Right, but that was... Oh, I think his internet is uh, dropping. Um, Liz Crane asks, uh, uh, Hey, guys, what... Oh, no, we're losing you, Chris. Um, Liz Crane asks, what planets can you see out there tonight? Uh, I always notice that the planets seem a bit brighter, or they don't sparkle, or the technical term is twinkle. Actually, that's not the technical term. The technical term is astronomical scintillation, which Ooh, is what... It, uh, that's is what quite scintillating. It is quite scintillating, yeah. isn't it? Um, and I actually just did an explainer video on that, so that's why it's all fresh in my brain. And that was not even plugged. Go, Liz. <laughs> Nicely done, Liz. Well, no, I haven't released it yet. We've only recorded it. Oh. Um, but the gist you is, like so, so stars twinkle, in fact, planets twinkle, the moon twinkles, the sun twinkles, and it's all happening because of atmospheric distortion. So... You know, the light is coming from the, uh, you know, from the distant star. It's passing through the atmosphere, and the atmosphere is distorting the position of the star. Right. And then what happens is that, you know, you've got various current changes, temperature changes in the atmosphere, and you end up with, uh, you know, with another, you know, the, the, the star moves to a different location because now the, the light is being distorted in different ways. And so you get this, this point source in the sky that's jumping around in the sky as it, as it moves around. It's the same um, way if we're looking through water. Yeah, so, exactly. So yeah, you your light's see... going through a vacuum because it doesn't need yeah. a medium. And then and it, it hits this atmosphere, and it's just waving about. So when you have really, dis, you know, highly disturbed in the atmosphere, you have you're seeing is crud. That's when you have a lot of wind. There's a lot of humidity going on, and so the yeah. light's diffracting around. And you start seeing these twinkles. Yeah, and so and so what's happening is is that you know the stars twinkle while the planets don't really twinkle because the stars are uh, are a point source or like an actual point in the sky. They're so far away, while the the planets are a, a little disk, you know, and so we're actually seeing, and so even though the planet, all the light from the planet is jumping around, it's still roughly staying within the area of this disk, and so we don't see the disk uh, moving, jumping around, and the same goes with the moon, and the same goes with the sun, and so on, but, you know, if you actually have a, like a really high-powered telescope, and you're staring at the moon, you can see it's just shimmering, and moving, and distorting, and stuff, and, uh, and astronomers actually use a technique. Well, they use two techniques, right? One technique is they take their telescope and they get above the atmosphere. So they launch it into space, and that allows them to view the sky without this distortion. The other thing they do is this, this technique called adaptive optics. So they shoot a laser beam into the sky. The laser projects a false star in the sky, and then they, they track what the, this false star is doing, and they can watch how the star is jumping around, but they know where the star is supposed to be. And then they have actuators, these little pistons on the back of the telescope mirror, and the, t the pistons push, you know, many times a second, Adaptive and pull out the distortion yeah. of, the, of what's going on in the sky. And you end up with this really, you know, really sort of very crisp, clear view, even though the atmosphere was distorting the whole time. So that and is why answer, stars twinkle and planets and to answer don't. the question, Saturn's up. <laughs> and Saturn's up. Well, no, she also wanted to know about twinkling, but yeah, Saturn's yes. up. 
Uh, and last week we had Saturn. Usually we can get Saturn. Um, and then I think, but Mars should be up too, shouldn't it soon? Uh, yeah, not right September? now. September. Yeah, really yeah, soon. In about two months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we should have, we should have uh, Mars up pretty soon. And Venus was up just recently, and I think yeah, it's it gone back Saturn. down again. Yeah. So. So yeah. here, everyone, though we can't get planets tonight, I'll give you Saturn since it's up. <laughs> Ooh, there we go. Uh, and nice. you know, a lot of. A lot of the moons there, it's really cute. And my favorite. Uh, uh, we got a request for V838 Mon, and unfortunately, it is uh, below the horizon for us. So we need our friends in the southern hemisphere to help us out. Uh, Corey, oh, I, I moved away from your view, Corey. Um, can you bring it's it back? It's okay. Um, yeah, I'm pulling it back up. As soon okay. As it comes up. There it is. It's the uh, Dumbbell Nebula, M27. Can you, can you? Is there any way that you can uh, zoom into the area? Uh. Probably. Give me a sec. Actually, I've got another thing that I don't need to zoom. This is the butterfly cluster. That's really low. Uh, it's oh, so you're getting a lot of distortion? Yeah, I'm getting a lot of extra light pollution and stuff, too. So, But I haven't ever imaged that, so I figured I'd, yeah, I, I, you can kind of see the butterfly there in the middle. Mm-hmm. So it's it's in it's also known as M six and it's in the constellation. M six. Yeah, it's in the constellation right. of Scorpius, which is, which is really close to Sagittarius, and it looks it totally looks like a, a scorpion in the sky. Kind of does. Yeah. 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 So is it like it's it's not really a butterfly? They just tell you it is, and you get stung. You right. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a Trojan butterfly. A Trojan butterfly. We need more of those in nature. <laughs> Um, then you're pulling up the dumbbell, right? Yeah. Where the hell was it? So you're pulling that up. I'll I'm going over, I'm going back to Gary's view while you pull that up. So here it is. Um, okay. All right, Gary, tell us what this one. is. You don't make me guess one. again. Did I get it wrong? <laughs> the propeller. The propeller. Yes, indeed. That's the one that uh, we found last year. For the first time we imaged it. It just got me uh, trying to move to another object here. I think I moved the scope. Yeah, anyway, that's the propeller, and that's a pretty cool thing in the sky. Yeah, and we talked to, to Thad last week about it. You know, why does it look that way? What's going on? You know, is it there's some kind of, uh, you know, what's causing this shape? And it's probably just luck. It's just the way we're looking at it. Because if you look at it from a different angle, it might just look like a blob. Yeah. It might have mm-hmm. a globular shape even. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which is a perfectly proper way to say it. It is. There's nothing wrong with the way you say it. No. Uh, yeah, so AKA DWB111. So this is not one of the Messier objects. And that's not, that's not surprising because... You know, it's the kind of object that it really takes a setup like Gary's to see it. I don't know. Would you be able to see this, Corey? Have you ever tried looking at the propeller nebula? I have never tried it, no. Hmm. I, I think you have something to do this week. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, all right, I'm going to move to Corey's view again. So here's a close-up view of the Dumbbell Nebula. And if you could do the Dumbbell Nebula, could you do the Ring Nebula too? Yes. All right. Uh, BTL743 notes that I'm very amped tonight. I had a nice cup of coffee. That was good. Very unwise for me because I'll be yeah. Uh, yeah, jittery all night. But also, <laughs> we don't have our PhD astronomers tonight, so I have to fulfill that role as well poorly. Hey, we'll tag team it. It's we'll tag right. team it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Scott and Fraser with our degrees, if you add them, no, you know what? We still yeah. don't even make a master's degree between the two of us. So No, we don't. Gary, have you got a PhD in something? No. No, I don't. Mm, I have right. a PhD in awesome sauce. Do you? Does that count? <laughs> no, it yeah. does not. Uh, Kevin Franklin notes that, uh, that Neptune is also out. And if Neptune's out, then probably uh, Uranus is out. And probably Pluto? I don't know if Uranus is out. Yeah. I can look. No, Uranus is in the Earth. No. Nope. Yeah. The Hourglass Planetary Nebula. And BTL743 is... is Really trying to find this, so. It's in, yeah, it's in Musca. So here's another image there of the dumbbell. 
<laughs> yeah, so so BTL 743, the constellation uh, Musca is in the southern hemisphere. So until you find us a southern hemisphere friend, we are not going to be able to show it. And we have some southern hemisphere friends. We just we do. need to uh, find a way to bring them in a TARDIS and broadcast from the past <laughs> or the future into the VSP. Yeah. Yeah, we need an Argentinian uh, Southern Hemisphere or Chilean Southern Hemisphere friend. We have some Australian and South African ones, but it's not going to work. And from Turkey. Is... And from Turkey. That's not the Southern Hemisphere. No, is he? yeah, he is in the, fairly in the northern. Yeah. We need yeah. more astronomers from across the globe. Yeah, exactly. Oh, Corey has changed his picture. Well, back to the butterfly. Let's see if there's any more questions here. Um, when will amateurs get adaptive optics? <laughs> when you have the money to pay for adaptive op optics. Yeah. It's still fairly new technology. I mean, well, I mean, you think about it, a lot of the new astronomy anyways, it's fairly new anyways. But... Yeah, there's so much that goes on with the primary to be able to do that. I would like one too, um, but yeah, it's it's not it's not available yet for consumer grade electronics, and consumer honestly, grade telescopes. It's not going to do you too much good. It's mainly used for science. So you, when you're needing it that fine tuned, even when you're trying to do even some great astrophotography, yeah, I'm sure a lot of astronomers would love it because it will add a little bit more to what you're doing. Yeah, this is more of a really judging the photons that are coming in. A few years ago when I was up at the Palomar 200 inch, mm -hmm. uh, they were retrofitting adaptive optics at that time and it was a million dollar unit. Yeah, yeah. And so Dale, if you is, want to invest a, a million dollars, we will totally have adaptive optics every week in the virtual star party. Yeah, yeah. And the ones that, uh, that are built with it, like the Kex, they actually move the mirror. Uh, what they were adding to the Palomar is a secondary unit that would adjust the light before, after it comes out of the mirror, it would adjust the light before it hits the eyepiece. Oh, okay. And that was kind of neat watching them do it, but they wouldn't let me help them. <laughs> <laughs> right. They were on to you, Gary. They were... Yeah, very narrow-minded. <laughs> uh, Beth just asked about the butterfly cluster. I don't know if that, when that comment came in. Um, it just updated on my end. Yeah. So the that was that's this image that Corey had there for a second there. AKA M6. Unless you were like you were recognizing it by eye and like, oh yeah, it's totally the butterfly. And then yes, Beth. Absolutely. And I know, yeah, your degree's almost up. Because you're I believe up in Northern California, Beth Johnson. And you're awesome. Been a fan with us for a while. Um, I love that we could recognize our fans for a while. I know, I Going know. for a while, we we're seeing familiar yeah. faces, and I love that. Uh, Ronald Minch says, "What map is best to use outside when viewing?" So I'm going to recommend Night Watch, which is a fantastic book. Now it's not a uh, map. Do I have my Night Watch here? Is it? Oh no, I don't. Okay, thought I had it handy. Er. Okay, I'll look for it for next week. Um, so it's a you can look it up on Amazon, and it's like a pretty big book, spiral bound, and it's got probably twenty or thirty pages of of uh, star maps, and it's got all these objects in it, and you it's just fantastic. So you you know you find the the part the portion of the sky that you want to see, and it's got it's got every single object that's inside of it. And you just open it up, and it sits flat. You can see it with your red light and just start finding objects inside of it and just, you know, just try. You know, depending on what telescope you've got, what setup you've got, some stuff you're going to be able to see it no problem, other stuff you're not going to be able to see, but I highly recommend Night Watch by Terence Dickinson, a good Canadian amateur astronomer. Well, and it's something, too, if you have a map like that, instead of just relying on a go-to mount, you become much more familiar with the night sky. So yeah. you just you can recognize things like the summer triangle up here. Like okay, I, I you just yeah. you know where you're at. You know the, the general area where you need to go, and it just helps you become more familiar when you're going outside. I I learned my entire night sky with night watch. Just okay. night after night out there over the course of a couple of years, got to learn all my constellations, all the major objects up there. You know, was observing them with my telescope. So uh, I'm gonna move to Corey's view. Yay! It's the Ring Nebula. The Ring and Lyra. In yeah. And this is a great example. You know, I, I go on and on about it, but this is this is my favorite, probably my favorite deep sky object, is this one right here. 
It was one of the first ones. Like I, it was one of those, you know, I had no idea what it was going to be, and I just turned my telescope to it, and there was this little donut in the sky right in my eyepiece. Mm. But yeah, now, I mean, with, the, with these modern cameras, I mean, look at that. There's like this nebulosity in the middle of it, this blue. Just amazing. So right here is the constellation Lyra with Vega. Oh, hold on, hold on. Wait a second. I've got to move over to you. Okay. So here's Vega, one of the big stars that you're able to see it in the summer sky. And here's the constellation that's known as Lyra. And zooming in, you see a little donut in the sky. Just like, and it looks spectacularly like Cori. So this is taken with a great... I forget actually where this came from, this image source in Solarium, but look at Cori's shot. This is in his backyard. Yep. They look totally identical. This is right. Yeah, I just yeah, it's love amazing. That. Yeah, so this is the source material, possibly used from the Hubble Space Telescope. And, and this then, is Corey being a boss. And this is Iowa. yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, on the borderline between yellow and orange. Yeah, this is amazing. Um, just terrific. So, so this is what's called a planetary nebula, and so this is what our sun may or may not look like when it reaches the end of its life. So the sun is burning hydrogen into it's helium burning. in its core. It it's is fusing. Not it is Thank fusing. You. Yeah, it's not burning. hydrogen burning. Anyway, okay. The sun is fusing hydrogen into helium in its core. And over time, it's going to run out of uh, hydrogen in the core, yeah. and it sort of it will have you know mostly helium. And when that happens, then the sun is going to sort of puff out and switch to it's going to switch to helium burning, and that's going to cause it to sort of expand out into this you know gigantic red giant. So that's what Betelgeuse is, although it's a different kind of red giant, and you know a lot of the red giants that we see in the sky. And then it's going to collapse back inward once it sort of runs out of that helium fuel, and it's going to puff out these outer layers right. into what's called a planetary nebula. And so you get these these sort of outer layers that just sort of puff out there. And there's tons of these different planetary nebula, right? There's the Ring Nebula. There's the one we already saw, the Dumbbell Nebula. There's the Hourglass Nebula, which we've been madly researching, uh, which we are not able to bring you. And a ton of other ones. We've got, we've got the Saturn, the Blue Snowball, the... Um, there's a ton of other nebula like that. And each one is very different. There's the Helix Nebula, the... The Eskimo Nebula, the so so with these planetary nebula, it seems like the structure of the nebula itself is caused by these these interacting magnetic fields and the way jets of gas and dust are coming off of these stars in their death throes, and each right. one is each one is completely unique, and uh, that's what the, makes them so are, amazing. Are the stars are able to keep their spherical shape is because of gravity, right? So everything's pulling it in while all this energy is being released outward. Well. When it fuses through all the, the hydrogen and moves to helium, it has a much smaller core. And so it's trying to pull that on. That's why a red giant gets so large, because the density of matter there is so small that's not able to actually contain it all in. The mass is not, you know, there's not enough mass in a star like our sun to start fusing those heavier elements. And so there's not, there should just be much more of that radiation coming out and not enough gravity to be able to pull it back in, which is why it starts sloughing off into space and puffing yeah. in. Uh, so, yeah, that's great. Oh, I'm going to move to Gary's view now. Um, the... Oh, forget. You should know this one. By I know, I know. The crescent? No. <laughs> the crescent, that's it. It is, okay. That's it. And there's a lot of, um, lot of stuff going on. You can see all the glowing gas around this area and then you've got the nebula but this is when you look at the Milky Way and you see just the glow going across this is in that area it's um in this I think Thad said this was a supernova or an exploding star of some type right so it so it's a uh, it's from a wolf ray star so uh, when when gigantic stars in their sort of very early stages they can be they can form a type called a wolf ray star and this is sort of a precursor. Uh, let me see. Yeah, so it already became a red giant about 250,000 years ago. Um, yeah, and so they're sort of really hot stars that happen sort of early on in their in their lives. And these are the kinds of these stars like this. They just go kaboom, 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 kaboom. and they vaporize, and that's that. So. Is, is Gary is saying here, yeah, it's right. I didn't realize center. Gary was grabbing that one, and I did the same thing. Oh, did you? Well, this is great. I love oh. to compare and contrast. Accidentally, <laughs> sorry, Gary. No, hey, no problem. 
that give you got color. Yeah. Yeah, but it's but you can really see the difference. So this is where Gary's view really shines because he's got this this ability to see this this very specific kind of light, and so it really brings out the detail. And, and so with contrast, yeah, with Corey's view, he's bringing out the color, um, but he can't, doesn't. You can't see as much detail in it. And that should be about the same rotation as Corey's too, right there. Um, yeah. Uh, Andrew Kerr yeah, asked, why do them. We need to use you for luminance and me for color. <laughs> that would be awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. Why do, how we put that together. Uh, we can do that Kerr live, right? says, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why do the clouds on the disk appear only on two opposite areas and not all the way around? It's because of our perspective. Yeah, so, so the, I mean, the question is, like, why do we see, like, with the ring nebula and stuff, we, or, you know, the hourglass and things like that, these sort of shapes. Sometimes what we're actually seeing is a is like a cylinder seen end on. So so we're actually looking right down this this cylindrical shape with the ring nebula. If you could see it from the sideways, it probably wouldn't look wouldn't have the same exact shape. So, you know, what you see as a as a planetary nebula just depends on the orientation of how we see it. Um, Ingrup asks, can anyone recommend an app for the iPhone that will read the screen while you're observing? Uh, they're, oh, for the iPhone, I don't know. For Android, it's pretty straightforward to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. I don't have an iOS phone. Yeah. Yeah, neither do I anymore. Um, can anyone image PanStars? PanStars isn't up for you guys, is it? I don't think, I don't so. think so. No, it's not right now. I see here... Um, Alan Davidson, what are Wolf Ray stars? They're Wolf Ray stars, R A Y E T. Yeah. And I'll link you at wherever I can find where that comment came from. Yeah. So, so essentially, but they're they are the biggest, they're the most massive stars. So when you get stars above like twenty solar masses, you get these Wolf Ray stars, right. and they are very short lived, very energetic, and they go kaboom when they're done and they turn into type type 2 supernova anyway they just explode they just vaporize when they're done there's no you know there's nothing left over no black hole just the thing just ex just explodes completely and so a lot of cases you get these big star forming regions with really heavy stars and the the, the heaviest stars turn into these wolf ray stars and then a couple hundred thousand years after they form you know a couple of million years at the most these things just start popping off Right. At, you know, as the, at the beginning of this this nebula star forming time, and then later on, you get the more the main sequence stars like our own sun, and even the smaller red dwarf stars, and they're going to last for you know billions of years and trillions of years. And so, but these but these the big stars they're gone within the first couple of million. Um, and you're gonna you know we're gonna get these kind of supernova in the big bright nebula. So when you look at the Orion Nebula, you look at um, uh, you know the the Trifid, the the Swan, all these places are going to have really heavy stars. The Tarantula Nebula, which is in the uh, Large Magellanic Cloud. Um, so I'm going to move back to Gary's view. Um, this is the, the veil. veil. Yeah, that's it. And uh, this is uh, the leftover from a, uh, an exploding star, supernova, a long time ago. In fact, I should be able to do this. Let me see if I can bring this up here. I love the Veil Nebula because, yeah, because there's portions of the Veil Nebula, and you can, you know, it's a gigantic view. And what we're seeing is we're seeing these just these fragments of this supernova drifting away from where the central explosion was. And so this is one piece of it. You know, another part of the sky, you can get another piece of it. And the actual size of this thing is just is just enormous, right? In the sky, you you know, you can't image the whole thing. With one field of view, you need to take multiple shots to kind of get the whole thing going. And so, you know, this was a supernova, as we mentioned before, that detonated completely. Uh, and now you're just seeing these pieces. And, you know, we're not going to see them for too much longer. They're just, you know, I mean, astronomically speaking. Right. You know. <laughs> right. Uh, so it exploded about 5,000 to 8,000 years ago. And now the area is about 36 times the area of the full moon. So you could take six full moons by six full moons, and that's the size of this just expanding shockwave that's kind of going on in space. Think like the Death Star blowing up, 
right? And so we're seeing this uh, explosion over time. It's yeah. it's really neat. I to, think we to should be able always describe that. things in Death Star. Yeah, and so there's like th two major portions, right? There's the Western Veil and there's the Eastern Veil. Which is the one you need? The Western Veil, which is the one that has a bright star on it. Right. Um, now this is this is real close to. Uh, let's see. Let me adjust a little bit. There we go. This purple square is my field of view. So this is what we're looking at right here. And yeah. then here's the eastern veil, and then here's all the little pieces in between. But if you look, you yeah. can see that that's roughly a circle. So a star somewhere around this area exploded at one point. I've uh, got a question from Alfonso Riviera. Don't we have a 3D-enabled satellite that can take a shot of a nebula in its full form instead of a 2D image? I'd seen a great stitched GIF a while back. So what you're thinking of, uh, and I forget his name, oh, but he's Finnish, and we've posted pictures from a lot on Universe Today, but he, he makes these things by hand in 3D. So what he does is he takes a, a two-dimensional image of a nebula and he sort of figures out where the various pieces that we're seeing in the nebula are probably in relations to each other in three dimensions. And then he 3D animates the view. And I, I wish I had one. I don't know, Scott, can you find one and maybe we can just show it in a little bit? Yeah, I can, yeah, I can try it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. You know the guy I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. We, we've oogled over his stuff for, you know, many months. Well, and to uh, answer the question, we can't take all views because we can't get out there. Right. So the only way that we could get a 3D image of a nebula is if we could go to two different locations very far apart. So if we could take one telescope and move it out to maybe Alpha Centauri and then keep one here, then we could make a 3D view of a, you know, a binocular view of a nebula. But we just can't do that um, without, uh, without being able to have that kind of distance. Now, you know, astronomers do use a, a method called uh, uh, parallax, oh, there we go, to, to figure out the distance to objects. And so what they do is, you know, they'll, they'll take a look at the view to a star when the sun is on one side or when the, when the Earth is on one side of its orbit, and then they'll move over to the other side of the orbit, you know, six months later, and they'll take another view, and then they'll, they'll use that to try and figure out how far away these objects are. Yeah. I thought you'd never use it. You yeah, well, it's you, you probably don't, but they do. They yeah. do. Because um, just right triangles you're dealing with then. That's the main thing that they're looking at is your... Because you know, you're a fixed point, my camera right here, and it just depends if I'm looking at you from over here, looking at you from over there, and you can judge based on what's behind it those, yeah. those angles, and that's actually what you Well, and here's the, here's the way you do this. So so hold your, your, your arm out, right? Hold your thumb up, and then look at some distant object, you know, like a light or something, and hold then just up. go back and forth with your, with your eyes. Go one eye, then the other eye, and you're going to see your thumb moving back and forth. And what's actually happening, all right, is, is so then it's the trigonometry. So it's the, it's the angle from one eye to your thumb to the background object, and then the angle from the other eye to your thumb to the background object. It's like and MySpace pictures. It's all about the angles. It's all about the angles. <laughs> what? No? No, all Are right. The selfies from a pub? Oh, I see, I see, yeah. selfie. Um, Stan... Minoski uh, says that Observer Pro for iPhone is good for identifying which deep sky objects are best positioned for viewing. That sounds great. I wish there was like a website that told us that. So we could just feed it into the star party and the astronomers could just follow the plan as opposed to improvising. I wish um, there was okay. like a publisher of, of awesome space stuff that could actually implement that on their own website. That sounds good. Um, all right. So, Corey, you have moved on. And I, what is this? This is um, something I've been wanting to test image for a while. It's uh, NGC 6939. That's the open cluster on the top. And then the bottom is the Fireworks Galaxy. The Fireworks Galaxy? This is Fireworks brand new. Galaxy. I we have know, never what's... seen this before. Well, you know, it is NGC 6946. Um, I knew I could fit them both in my field of view, and I've always wanted to try, and I figured. Why not? So, Gary, why have you never brought us the Fireworks Galaxy before? Um, I'll have to get back to you on that. That's terrific. <laughs> wow. I just finished a four-minute. That This is a three-minute. I just finished a four-minute exposure that I'm going to look at and see if it turned out better. Eh, yeah. A little bit. That's um, amazing. What a great little galaxy. It's actually really pretty. Um when you get all the color and after stacking and, and everything. 
And um, it's quite active in star formation. Um, it's had nine supernova in have been observed nine. in it. Yeah, in the last hundred years or so. Okay, you are right. really clicking. I'm I'm muting you again, Corey. You're click click click. <laughs> All right, I just so switched the I switched the uh, image to my four minute exposure now. So. Okay, it it's looks about bit, the same. A little bit nicer. A little nicer. But these are just like raw pictures coming right out of your telescope. So this yeah, is, this, is, this is no editing at all. So. Yeah. Oh, that's terrific. So it's 10 after 10 uh, Pacific Standard Time, so we will probably... Pacific Daylight Time, so we'll probably have to uh, to wrap things up. The time just flies. We're having so much fun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I've got um, one exposing of the other side of the veil, so... Okay. About 30 seconds. Bring it, and and I will start to, to wrap things up. So... Um, Chris, thanks for sh thanks for showing up. I know you were kind of struggling with some technology, and hopefully you're going to have yep. some nice clear skies and be able to uh, to bring us some some views in an upcoming week. So and I think it'll be great because you've got, like you said, you've got the six inch telescope, so that's going to show people like a nice yep. entry level telescope that they can that they can really use. So, so that's terrific. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, you're and Corey, thanks, man. You are sorry. I hate to say this, man. You are click tastic. What's what's the click coming from? I wonder. It's me alt tabbing between all the thousand windows that I have. Sorry. <laughs> all right. Because I don't have a headset on right now as well. Oh, uh, for sure. Oh, oh, you know better than that. Oh yeah. Hey, okay. hey, hey! I brought you beauty. You did. You did. I know. Okay. We 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 wrangled you in at the last minute to join us. So. Yeah. Um, well, thanks a lot, Corey. And this is this is fantastic. And I highly recommend if you haven't already, follow Corey on all of the places because. His, he's posting tons of really beautiful pictures, great, like, full sky, Milky Way, deep sky stuff with his uh, pretty great 14-millimeter uh, 14 lens. And uh, so, well, so check out... You yours. I'm, 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 I've actually fallen in love with it. So <laughs> I actually just got the 35 now. So I've got the 35, the 85, and the, and the 14. Oh, good. Yeah. So and I'm, I might go out and take some shots tonight. Actually, it's clear skies, so I might go do that. Anyway, so thanks a lot, Corey, and I hope no you that, and that mount is terrific. Hang on to it. When, it does. When, it works. It works well. Yeah. When the actual owner comes by, I don't know how. I'll, I'll lose it somehow. Yeah, there you yeah. go. I don't know. <laughs> All right. So Gary, you've given us the other side of the veil. So right. as this I mentioned, this is like this. Kaboom. Exploding. That's again a one-minute exposure. So I think I we're just, all tired. I love how wispy it is. That's just yeah. something I, I just. Yeah. It looks like it's a it's a bad cloud in front of your image you know, that you're trying to it get. But no, that's that's space. Uh, Ronald Minch says uh, just mentioned Ison, so we're still a little early to see Comet Ison, but boy, in the next kind of uh, whoo, the next couple of months, this is it. We actually yeah. talked quite a bit about this on the the uh, weekly space hangout, but uh, okay. Comet Ison is going to be showing up at the end last half of this year, and it's just yeah. going to be terrific or suck. And on Wednesday, I'm going to be in a hangout with Space Telescope with the Hubble Hangout, and we're going to talk about Hubble imaging ISO when it comes through later this week. Well, they morning. already did a they did a terrific uh, time lapse of it, and it's just amazing. So yeah. I cannot wait. Uh, you know, it's been ten years since we've had a really nice North Hemisphere bright comet. So I mm -hmm. think this is it. Uh, if you want to know about chance. more about ISO, Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. Is when we'll be up on Google Plus and YouTube. Oh, great! Okay. Site that org is yeah. the official for Hubble Hangouts. Who's who's going to be joining you from Hubble? Um, Tony Darnell. Yeah. It's going to be Alberto Conti, and oh, so yeah, four more people. Oh we're wow! Just, okay. We're going to have a bunch of awesome people talking about the amazing things that Hubble's able to do regarding this comet, but also other com you know, just comets in general too, to really go into detail. Yeah. About what's going on, what we're going to see, and hopefully that doesn't get sucked into the sun. And the big question is: it going to hit us? Stay tuned. It, it would no, no, it won't not hit going, us. Wow. The, the the short, it, no, it's no, not going no. to hit us. No, the there is no possible gas, way it could though. ever hit us yeah. at all. The not only going. risk is is yeah. that it might crash into the sun. Right, which would be sad because we want to yeah. see it as it comes back around, which is yeah. close to the path to us. Yeah, so right. it's gonna it's gonna be really well position so uh, cool all right so and Gary thanks again you are a uh, just a, a rock we it's great to have you joining us and have I'm that really nice clear view something 
<laughs> All right, awesome. And thanks, Scott. So, so one last plug for your for your next hangout. It's going to be Wednesday. Wednesday, four p.m. Eastern. One um, Pacific. One p.m. Pacific, which would make it eight. Yep. P.M. UTC. Yep. And so, yeah, if you want more information, it's over on Google Plus. If you go to hubblesite.org, it's the official uh, website for the Hubble Space Telescope. Yep. And it's being put on through the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore. Terrific. And uh, sort of our next thing, we're going to be doing astronomy cast tomorrow at uh, noon Pacific. Depending, Pamela is in Portugal now, so that'll be uh, that'll be interesting. See if we can get her her connected up from Portugal. Uh, and then we'll be doing the uh, weekly space hangout on Friday, where we bring together a bunch of space journalists and we talk about the uh, the big events of the week. So hopefully uh, you'll be able to tune in for that. Uh, if you haven't already, click subscribe in YouTube, uh, wherever the subscribe button is. Follow and, us uh, on Twitter, and I will see, underscore BSP. There you go. And Facebook. we will see everybody next week. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Good night. Thank you.